Good morning. Welcome to our commission meeting for October 22nd, 2024. I'm going to call our meeting to order and note for the record that we have a quorum of commissioners present. Um, remind everybody to silence your phone and um, sign in at the back of the room in the back corner there if you are going to be speaking today. We do need your name and county for public record. Um, also be mindful that we have voting next door and that there are state laws prohibiting the distribution of um, or campaigning for or against any person or issue in the in or near the polling places. Um, copies of the statute can be found about the building. Just ask for one if you're curious. And I'm going to ask you to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, move on to our routine business and look for a motion to approve our agenda. So moved. Second. Motion is second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Moving on then to our consent agenda. Um, is there consent agenda has our bills to be paid, some of the uh, mundane routine business of the county, personnel actions, etc. all available for public record if anybody would like to see it. Um, the auditor's office has copies of all that. Um, anybody from the public that would like to comment on anything on the consent agenda, please, sir. Chad Ellsworth, Rapid City. I'm uh, requesting that uh, that you uh, bump number two back to the agenda, uh, approval of the commission meeting minutes for October 15, 2024. Uh, for that portion of the meeting that was under non-action commission discussion, commissioners held a discussion regarding the various elect election concerns and attacks on the commissioners. This was uh, done in violation of SDCL 6117, which uh, uh, there's no discussion if a conflict of interest exists. Um, discussions uh, with, were withheld, uh, well, the commission withheld its authority to act on the various uh, election concerns when it knew it was uh, <coughs> empowered to resolve those concerns. And that power comes from SDCL 7820, power to institute and prosecute civil actions. The concerns in this thing were the 32, the 30 day residency requirement, SDCL 12-4-1. The specific utterances were at the beginning of Mr. Karski, nobody tells me what I'm supposed to do. That's uh, in violation of 7820. He has a duty to institute, prosecute those civil actions. At 4952 of that tape, I don't prosecute laws, and it was deception when he said laws, insufficient and in misinformation of SDCL 7820. Uh, Miss, uh, I guess I'm not supposed to mention the names, but uh, Miss Bender at 5043, Reached, said, stated she reached out to the sheriff and turned it over to the appropriate official, state and federal. They have the authority, she stated. Mr. Kipley, uh, 5141, the controlling function here is going to be the federal law. The violations involved, in there, and there's a couple more in there, but I would like to have it bumped back to the agenda so it can be resolved. You have the authority to do that. I'd like to see it bump back to the agenda. Um, and that's my request. Thank you. Any other public comment on the consent agenda? Commissioners, any questions or want to remove anything from the consent agenda? I'll move approval. Second. 
Motion and a second. Call the roll. Kipley? Aye. Benega? Aye. Bender? Aye. Weinberg? Aye. Kursky? Aye. Consent agenda is approved. Moving on to regular business. A public hearing to continue consideration to declare the property legally, legally described as the north one half of the southeast one quarter, excluding R6, excluding R1, and excluding County Villa Estates and X Nelson's edition, extract one, Elber's edition, section 26, T101 North, R51 West, a public nuisance and an act, South Dakota codified law, 21106. Kevin, good morning. Good morning. I am Kevin Hookman, County Planning Department. Uh, yes, this item uh, is a continuation of public nuisance of the property owned by Kyle Elbers. Uh, the item was first heard on August 20th of, of this year, uh, where staff presented the, the property to you. Uh, at that county commission, uh, the action was to defer the hearing until today, October 22nd. Staff did visit the site as recently as October 15th and found that the, the nuisance was removed. Um, as so right now, staff planning department defines there's no longer a public nuisance and recommends no further action. And I have a couple of photos that you can kind of look through there. Um, you can remember this is kind of where it started in this uh, winter of this year. And then throughout the summer, and this is where it was. Uh, it appeared like there was the one pickup there that appeared to be there for, uh, in conjunction with the harvest. So uh, there's no nuisance on the property. All right. We, this is a public hearing, so we take in order proponents. Um, at this point, the necessity of a public hearing is, or the any action from a public hearing is not necessary, but we would still take comments on this item. Anybody here that would like to comment to the commission on these this agenda item? Any opponents to the public nuisance? Commission, turn it to you for action. Just to be clear, Kevin, are we what are our options here? Um, I guess uh, I, I think that really it would be, you could make a motion to, to uh, move forward with no action, or I guess I don't think that even a motion would be necessary. It'd just be a recognize that there, the property is clear and, and we can move forward with no further action, unless <laughs> you have a different opinion. <laughs> Any advice from our attorney? I don't know that you need to take a formal action at this point. Please withdraw it now. Okay. So no motions by the commission. We'll let the action die without it, or we'll let the agenda item die without any action. Is that the proper way? Unless you want to take a vote to commemorate this, probably for Kim's preference. Put it in the form of a negative here. You could agree with the request from the planning commission to withdraw. But okay, I'll, I'll make a motion to uh, concur with the planning uh, department's recommendation to withdraw this item. I'll second that. Motion and a second. Call the roll. Kipley. Aye. Bender. Aye. Weinberg. Aye. Benega. Aye. Kursky. Aye. Motion carries. Public hearing to consider declaring the property legally described as Track 2 Peterson's Edition in the Northeast Quarter and the Northeast South, Northeast Quarter and Southeast Quarter of Section 26 T103 North, R49W, a public nuisance and an act of South Dakota codified law, 21106. Welcome back. Yes. Uh, so this public nuisance, uh, the property owner is Robert and Kimberly Rudecki. Uh, the property address is 25445 477th Avenue. Uh, and this is also another one that was uh, first received in the winter this year. And staff re uh, reviewed the property several times throughout the spring and summer. Uh, the property owner was doing some work on the property here and there. Um, removing a, a couple of items uh, at a time sort of thing. Uh, but it came, comes to a point where uh, uh, 
progress is no longer happening or happening at a slow enough rate that we need to move forward with something else. Um, the staff recently visited the property on October 15th, and I'll go maybe over some of the photos uh, throughout the summer and the most recent photos. So there's the site. You can see from the, even the aerial imagery, there's some stuff going on, uh, mostly on the, the front yard here. Um, this would be the early uh, winter uh, photos here. Lots of vehicles, a couple of trailer, uh, little tiny home trailers, um, other things throughout the property. This would be April <coughs> in the spring. See some vans that are, are inoperable there. This would be later in the spring. Notice the next car kind of hiding in the trees there. Um, summer, um, keep on kind of moving along, I guess. Uh, a trailer here. Um, this, if it is to remain on the property, needs a building permit. Um, but you can see that some things have kind of moved off, like the, the trailer homes, the tiny homes have been removed, uh, a couple of vehicles, uh, but there's still some kind of scattered stuff. This is September and then October here. Uh, he, these vehicles have been licensed recently in that October photo, um, but you can still see a trailer and some other stuff kind of laying around. Um, uh, this uh, vehicle, a hood popped open, likely not runnable. Uh, van here, there's the, the other like uh, car back here, some other stuff in front of the garage. The trailer's still there. So that's where we're at today. Um, uh, Minneapolis County uh, Public Nuisance uh, lists uh, abandoned property as a public nuisance, and this would fall under the definition of abandoned property. South Dakota Codified Law 2106 allows the county to declare a public nuisance to allow the county to clean up the property and defray the cost of the po property owner. Uh, the Planning and Zoning Department requests that Minneapolis County Commission declare a public nuisance on this uh, track to Peterson's Additions in the northeast quarter, the northeast quarter, the southeast quarter of section 261349 West. Um, is there any questions? All right, thank you, Kevin. At this point, we'll take, it is a public hearing, so if, is the property owner present? Um, do, now would be your opportunity to um, talk to the commission about actions that you're taking, your plans for this property, um, why we should not declare it a public nuisance. Okay, the uh, picture that's showing there, we're pushing that, I'm taking parts off of that vehicle to just have for the other vehicle he said that was inoperable, that's, not, that's licensed and drivable. Uh, the other vehicle is my son's, it's now licensed. We're waiting on the uh, rear only plate. I've got the receipts if anybody needs to see that. We're in the process of moving and we're taking trips to Arkansas. We don't get a lot of time to get down there, but that is the plan. Um, we've gotten rid of three of those vehicles in the last week. So we did talk to the lady that came out to <coughs> let her know what our progress was. So he works overnight, so it does take a little time, and we only can do one thing at a time. So that's why there's other stuff still in the yard. And we did talk to her about having to get a lean to or a three sided building for a few of the cars. And for the one next to the yellow bug, I didn't realize that we needed a building permit for that since you're not no, building. No, that, that's so. a cargo container that we're hauling to Arkansas. So, so that's something that we had no clue on, since it wasn't actually a stick built thing. I didn't think you needed that. So no, we were never aware of that. So, <laughs> so. Okay. but otherwise, you can see that we have done the driveway quite a bit. We just have to get it to Nordstrom's and. But you can see there's progress. But yeah, it does take a while to get to Arkansas. It's a 10 hour drive. So I swear that's where I'm heading now when I get done. How long do you think it'll take? 
Well, like I say, three of those vehicles are gone in the last week. So, so are you selling the property? And no, no, son, no, our son stuff. will be staying here. Okay. Commissioner Bender. I just would like to follow up on Commissioner Skarsky's question. How long do you think it will take for it to be done? Well, can you give us, I mean, could well, you have it all done in a month? We've been there 26 years, so I mean, it's been. <laughs> all we're asking about are the things that are outside. And we need it, I need a date so that oh, we can decide how to handle this. That'd be you. At least a, probably a couple months, be, or at least before the snow hits is what our plan is. So. Yeah. Before the snow hits. We're yeah. hoping that's not next week, no. right? No. no well, it could be, but right. no. We're hoping by the end of uh, November. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Do I have to stand here? Uh, Kevin, I, quick question. What's the, I know we did some changes regarding um, shipping containers and what, how long can you have a shipping container or like a, a pot or whatever, et cetera, for, on your property, if you don't mind? Yes, a shipping container can be on the property for 90 days without a building permit to be moved. Okay. Um, so, yeah, if it's longer than 90 days, then it'll need a building permit. Okay, thank you. All right, any um, here, anybody that, that would like to speak in favor of this um, public nuisance being declared, now would be your opportunity. Okay. I don't see a need for a rebuttal. I'm moving on then to commission discussion and action or questions. Well, I'd be willing to give them until the end of November to get this property cleared up, but I would expect it to be done by that time. I think that's probably after our first snowfall, to be honest with you, but um, so, I would be willing to, to um, give them to the end of November and have another hearing at that time. So the first Tuesday in December have the hearing? Yes. Okay. I would agree with uh, Commissioner Bender's comments and uh, hopefully we won't have to deal with this after that again. I'll, I'll concur and make that a formal motion to defer to the first Tuesday in December. A second. Motion and a second. Call the roll. Kipley? Aye. Bender? Aye. Blainberg? Aye. Benega? Aye. Kersky? Aye. Motion, ca motion carries. So we have December, whatever the first Tuesday is, the fourth, third. Okay. Um, at that point, we'll have, um, we'll bring this back and we expect to see significant, if not complete, cleanup of the property done. So thank you. Moving on then, public hearing to de consider declaring the property legally described as public nuisance violation of the property legally described as lot one, track three, innergs tract in the east half, southeast quarter of section seven, T101 North, R48 West, a public nuisance and an act South Dakota codified law 21106. Kevin. Yes, uh, this public nuisance uh, case was at the property address 1501 North Six Mile Road. This will be about a quarter mile north of the intersection of East Madison Street and Six Mile Road. Uh, staff received uh, complaints about this property in the spring of this year. Uh, one specific concern of the general complaint about stuff and junk on the property was also the camper located in the right of way of East Elson Place. Uh, staff has been sending letters to the property owner throughout the summer and has not received any contact from the property owner um, uh, or any noticeable changes to the property. Uh, the only noticeable change is that I, I did notice that the license plate tag on the camper that's in the right-of-way was updated, uh, but the camper still uh, does not appear to be operable and is, and is not parked on the property. Uh, the staff visited the property on October 15th and took updated photos, and I'll kind of go through some of these here quick. There's the property location along the highway. It does have a uh, driveway along uh, North Six Mile Road there, and you can see the, the 
road, the private road that goes back to several other houses right here to the north of it. Some of the photos uh, turn out a little blurry. You can't tell uh, it's blurry until after you put them on a, an actual screen. I thought it was focused. Um, but you can see that there's some stuff scattered throughout the yard. Um, here's that camper and that right away here and some cars and things <coughs> parked on the, along the driveway. I got some other pictures of that. This is already right on the between the driveway and that north uh, uh, of the property line along the private road there. And you see stuff just accumulating into the uh, trees there and along the garage. Get a little bit more of that through the spring and summer. Nothing has noticeably changed. Camper is still there. Um, stuff in the front yard of the property. Um, stuff on that side yard or along the uh, private road. Still during the summer through the stuff in the front yard. There's the camper van uh, with stuff now, weeds growing up around it. Vehicles. And then now we're into the most recent uh, October photos. Uh, stuff kind of scattered throughout that front yard up next to the garage and the house. And here's that van. Uh, it still has not moved with weeds and stuff growing around it. Um, so again, uh, staff is requesting this property be declared a public nuisance. Uh, described lot one of track three, except H1 Enberg's tracks in the east half of the southeast quarter of section seven, a township 101 north, range 48 west, a public nuisance. Is there any questions? All right, thank you, Kevin. Um, it is, again, is a public hearing. Um, we'll start with the property owner. Is the property owner here to address the commission about cleanup of this property? All right. Doesn't appear so. Anybody that would like to speak um, in favor of cleaning up this property? My name is Bruce Hansom. I live on uh, 7505E Alston ID. How are you? <laughs> um, the property is an eyesore and it's been that way for uh, a good amount of time, probably going back 10, 15 years, and it seems to get progressively worse. It's a huge eyesore for uh, especially the people that live on Alston who have to turn that corner every time we go home and leave. Um, and we would be in favor of some action to take care of it. It's it's really a mess. Thanks. If you don't mind, Mr. Els, Mr. Hansom, um, it appears like we haven't received any communication back from the property owner. Are you aware of somebody living at this property? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. See a lot of heads nodding. So okay. Thank you. All right, Commission. Action or discussion? Oh, anybody want to rebut? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm Jill Kessler, I live at 7601 East Elston Place, and our property line is, um, we share a property line. And in addition to all of the, the things that kind of scattered and shown in the photos, there's um, debris, down trees, um, and I would also um, ask that the dead trees, that are, there's at least two dozen um, pine trees that are dead and considered a fire hazard. And we have a cedar house. And um, so I would ask that be considered as well. Excuse me. Other comment in favor of this action? My name is Mike DeBoer. We live at 7501 East Alston Place. We've been trying and trying to work with these guys for a long time, trying to get this cleaned up, and they just don't want to do anything. I even talked to the previous um, Royce, which has now passed away, and it's his son and his wife that are at the place. Um, 
And I've talked to them and tried to help them, you know, clean it up, whatever. And they just, it's like they don't want to do anything to help us out. And we got a lot of family and stuff that come and they're like, why does this place look like this? And that's why we're trying to get something done. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody want to rebut the comments? All right. I think we have a, can we just show the amount of people that are here that are concerned? Can we just stand up? I will allow that. So all those in favor of enacting this public nuisance declaration. Okay. Now we have a good idea. Thank you, sir. Commission action. Given the fact that we've tried hard to contact these folks and have action taken that they have not responded, they didn't come today, I feel like we have no choice left. The only card we have left to play is declare it a, a public nuisance, and that'd be my motion. I'll second that. Motion and a second. Further comments or questions? Kevin, are we allowed to do anything with the dead pine trees? Um, so the the ordinance uh, says that anything that is uh, injurious to the public health is considered a public nuisance. Uh, and I guess uh, I typically have not uh, included trees in public nuisances because I just usually isn't one. Uh, but if, if we feel it, public nuisance uh, or that the trees are danger to the public health and yes we can remove the trees as part of this thank you sir okay we have a motion and a second i'm going to call the roll bender aye benega aye kipley aye Leinberg, aye karski aye motion carries Moving on then, we have a presentation starting that season from the Glory House. Nikki Devorah, Christy Husby. Good morning, commissioners. Thanks for letting us present this morning. And Christy didn't change her look from a couple <laughs> years ago. I, I, I brought another staff member with me and it just, um, Christy's on the invoice. And so I think that's uh, why it wasn't corrected. Uh, but I want to, I'm Nikki Devorah and I am the president of Glory House. And I want to thank you for your continued support for our agency. Uh, we haven't had much happen since last year. Two buildings demolished, uh, addition of 26 apartment units, move of 360 of our staff. So we, we just really haven't had much going on this year. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through our slide really briefly because I know that we have gone in depth over our services the last couple of years. And we continue to grow, but I do want to give um, honor our, found, found, our father and our founder, Roger Fredrickson, whose uh, vision continues to bless people and our community, which includes our staff. And so what we've been doing for the last uh, nine months is really working on developing and completing the new apartment complex, which is on our property. We have completed this project and we had the ribbon cutting uh, just a few weeks ago on August 13th. We had tenants start to move in on June 10th of this year. And so what that allowed us to happen is provide additional housing, lower income units, which allows people who have been impacted by the justice system, a, a nice, clean, new opportunity to live in a recovery-based community because our other services are just a few feet away. We also have commercial space, which has our counseling team on the first floor. And we also have all of our outpatient groups that take place for alcohol and drug treatment. We have approximately 60 employees at Glory House, and I am very excited today to say we have no openings on our staff team. Uh, so that's that's been a pretty big achievement, but that also transcends to really good services for our clients that we serve. And then we have also had uh, Recently, I know this wasn't included on the PowerPoint, but I just want to mention it. We've been consulting with a with Amy Pokla 
for a new strategic plan, which the vision of the Glory House continues to grow. Our next big plan is to look at some additional services, and Stacy is going to be introducing himself and talking just a minute about that. So I'm going to pass this over to Stacy. So my name is Stacy Kudel. I'm a resident of Hartford, South Dakota, and so I live in Minnehaha County. And I started with uh, Glory House on July 15th of this year. For the last 26 years, I've been working in philanthropy as a development director for um, many different organizations, including secondary education, human services, uh, health systems in the area, and now uh, with the Glory House. So um, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity and thank the commission for the support that we've received for the last year. As Nikki says, we've finished the building. and. Um, if you ever need a tour come by I'll be happy to give you a tour um, and our next big project that we're going to be looking at is um, more than likely uh, redoing our men's facility it's overcrowded and we need more space and so um, that'll be our next big project that's going on at the glory house and that'll enable us to accompany and service uh, more people it is a high demand so Anyway, I just want to thank you and see if anybody has any questions. I'd be happy to answer them. Stand by, sir. We might get to that. Okay. Any other comments? Com Commissioner, do you mind if I go to public comment first? Sure, go right ahead. All right, public comment on this presentation from the Glory House. All right, Commissioner Benega. Thank you. Um, just wondering about where you're at with your occupancy right now with the new addition that you built this summer or finished this summer. Go ahead. Currently what we have is we are at for the most recent unit. We have 28 uh, of those units occupied uh, and we have nine people who are working on their applications. Sometimes that's a little tricky with tax credits and some other laws that impact us. And so the hope is that we're going to have those other nine people move in pretty quickly. And the goal, of course, is to have 95% occupancy by December 1st. Thank you. Other questions? I have a quick quick one you know we get asked frequently about homelessness in the community and that type of thing how many of the people that you uh, are housing do you think would be homeless without the services you provide well you're right this is a little bit of a tricky question and so in with my experience my my best anticipation is probably about 35 to 40 people uh, would be without housing so that also factors are they living in a car temporary you know hotel uh, so it has really impacted our community at a, at a really great level uh, and i know that other partners really appreciate that which is parole services court services uh, even um, the public defender's office uh, we work very closely with just home and so all of you are very familiar with that and uh, as a matter of fact, on Wednesday, we are one of the host sites uh, for Just Home, expecting 45 people from across the nation to come and tour the apartments because uh, we are the most advanced of all of those who've received that, um, been very fortunate to receive that funding from Just Home. And so uh, they were very impressed with us when we had the ribbon cutting in August. So they wanted to use us and the St. Francis House as really an example of how far our progress has been with such small, you know, little bit of time. 18 months we had it together. So Congratulations and, and thank you for what you do. Thank you. Commissioner Bender. So I just want to thank you for mentioning that Just Home Project. That's what I was going to bring up. And um, and the fact that we are a site this week. We appreciate you being open and welcoming those folks from across the nation. Uh, the Just Home Project was a lot, it was a heavy lift. And um, housing for people who are justice impacted is particularly challenging. And so 
Um, we really appreciate the work that you guys have done historically in that space and partnering um, with the, um, the Just Home Project to provide additional housing that was much needed in our community, particularly for those justice impacted. So thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Mr. Chair. Mr. Blindberg. I just wanted to echo, <clears throat> excuse me, those sentiments. I was able to be at the ribbon cutting and participate in some of the meetings with the safety and justice challenge folks that were here in August and the Glory House staff um, just did an excellent job of giving everybody a tour and explaining the background. And um, you can tell the, the team that you have is um, very passionate and very skilled at what they do. Um, so I just wanted to pass on that too, that it, it's um, quite an accomplishment for our area. So thank you. Thank you. I work with a bunch of great people. Mm -hmm. I could tell. Nikki, Stacy, thank you for being here today. Thank you. Moving on to our Sioux Empire Livestock Show presentation. Good morning, Brooke. Well, good morning, Commissioners and Chair. Um, thank you for having me this morning. I also want to thank you for your continued support of the Sioux Empire Livestock Show, but also the Agribusiness Division of the Chamber. As you know, I serve as the Agribusiness uh, Manager excuse me, at the Chamber of Commerce. So I just want to give you a brief overview of that division and then especially um, the Sioux Empire Livestock Show because that's specifically where we move those funds to um, throughout the year. Um, the first slide that I've included today is just the pillar and what we stand on um, and the purpose that we serve to the community in terms of our membership as well um, and through these actions that we have in terms of the visibility in the community and the industry. Um, this is just a list of our upcoming and previous events. That top one is a previous event um, and then the upcoming are two of our largest events that we have. Um, like I mentioned, we had just celebrated our 7th annual National Farmers Day at the barn. We try to coordinate this with National Farmers Day, which is recognized on October 12th. Um, this is an afternoon activity that we geared towards family and kids that come out. Um, this year we had incredible weather and we had about 150 attendees and that includes a lot of youth that came out. We had acti activities with South Dakota sor corn excuse me, and soybean. And of course, I did some activities with the kids um, that did related to um, some pigs and cattle. And it was a great um, just family fun day to come out to Falls Park and also check out the Stockyards Egg experience. Um, upcoming in January, we have on the Sioux Empire Livestock Show, which has been running for 72 years. Um, many of you have been able to be out there for various <coughs> events. You've toured the facility. Um, this is my favorite one of all, and it's January 21st through 26th, so I encourage you all to come out throughout that week. Um, this has an expected reach of about 10,000, including families um, that come across the country um, with about a 15 state reach, we say, and that goes all the way down to Texas, um, over to Colorado, those western states, and all the way over um, to Indiana and all those um, kind of eastern states as well that kind of come here to Sioux Falls and they recognize this show as a world-renowned show um, that they come to. It's a lot of their favorites, a lot of them tell me. Um, some highlights that we've been able to have for the youth, um, we have about over a thousand exhibitors. Those are all kids that are under the age of 21 that come here, <clears throat> excuse me again, with their families. <clears throat> Um, and then my favorite part is Friday night, the sale of champions, um, where we take the top 25 market livestock from that week and the kids essentially auction off that premium, not the animal. So with the community support on um, this past year, we were able to pay out $127,000 to those kids. Um, and I don't see a single penny of that. Um, the chamber doesn't, the show doesn't. We directly pay all that back to the kids. And that's something we pride ourselves on of not taking a percentage of that for them. Um, I'm super excited for this year that we have coming up. We're um, excited with some other shows that fall um, a little bit before us that we can hopefully boost our numbers as well of the time frame that has happened. Um, and again, it's a lot of where our funds go that you guys support as well. Another event that I know many of you support and um, that will be coming up again in August, of course, is our annual Ag Appreciation Day. And um, this is an event that seeks to just salute farmers and ranchers um, across South Dakota, especially here in the eastern part of the state. And um, we serve 3,000 people this past year again. And many of you came to help serve the meal. So I want to thank you again for helping with that as well. Um, and if you want to know how much that kind of takes, it's about 1,300 pounds of pork, about 24 gallons of pickles, and I think like 12 gallons of barbecue sauce. So it's a really weird order you get to put in every year. Um, but again, it's just a great day to be out at the fair to get people back onto the county fairgrounds for truly what I say is that family fun time at the fair um, as well. Um, and again, I just want to thank you again for your support and helping advance agriculture here in South Dakota and especially the eastern half. So with that, if there are any questions, I would be happy to answer them for you. 
All right. Any public comment on this presentation? All right. Questions for Brooke? Brooke, this is a big deal to our community, and life, our ag is our number one driver of our economy. So keep it up the good work. Thank you. Consider a motion to authorize the highway department to purchase two truck builds and dump bodies for new plow trucks through the source well procurement contract number 080818 in the amount of $424,804. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Commissioner. Steve Garone, Highway Superintendent. Uh, last month we were here and the commission approved the purchase of two Freightliner chassis. We're back now. We uh, have our order ready to submit to Henderson Products to complete them for snow plows. It's been a long process. We we're hoping to get the chassis sometime over the winter and then get our trucks over to Manchester, Iowa so that they can add the additional equipment so we'd have them for next fall. So I'm looking for your permission to go ahead and place the order. Public comment. Commission action. Make a motion to approve. Second. Motion a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Oh, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you, Steve. Consider a motion to approve the 2025 health and dental insurance premiums. Good morning, Carrie. Good morning, Carrie Deaver from Human Resources. Uh, the first item I have for you today is a discussion and approval of the premiums for 2025. I've included a few slides for you. I'd like to start with the dental insurance. Same type of format as you've looked at in the past. This gives you a quick overview of our claim totals for the past few years, as well as our administrative fees and the total cost for just the dental side of the house. Uh, you can tell that we've had an increase in 2023. Um, we had projections for 2024 that it would go up. It did, but not as high as we thought. The good news for that is when we're looking at a total of what we're expecting next year with our average increase per year in claims of about 6%, and no increase in administrative fee that we need to take in about $540,000 worth of premiums and our current premiums are joined that. So I'm not recommending an increase for um, 2025 on the dental side. Now those are fairly small claims compared to our health. So this gives you the same type of information on the health. Um, few more factors with that. We have our claims, stop loss premiums, our prescription claims are broken out separately for you, and then our administrative fees for our third-party administrators and the people who help us run our plan. Um, you might remember, or these two areas are highlighted in blue because that is the year that we had the claim leg in 2022, and those cleared in 2023. That's made projecting forward a little bit more complicated than it had been in the past. Um, but overall, we're looking like we're going to end up um, 2024 at about $3.8 million in claims. The good news there is that is also lower than we had projected for 2024. So taking our best estimate, and that's all it can be, um, what to expect for 2025. Um, we've been trending closer to you know, an 8% or what we would expect to be on trend is 8%. I'm using 10 instead just because I, I think we've had a good year and I expect that next year we might have to make up for that. But even with a 10% increase in projected costs for health claims and what we're anticipating for stop loss premium, the same 10% applied for prescriptions and what we know will be a 5% increase for administrative fees, we're projecting we would end up with about $8.1 million in costs for 2025. More good news here is that our current premiums are taking in that amount, so we think we'll have adequate cost. A um, <clears throat> couple things you might remember from our budget, budget presentation that we included 8%. Um, I, I am hard pressed to see me coming before you during a budget presentation and recommending any less than 8% because it's so early in the process. Um, the good news here for us as an organization, and that's about $550,000 in savings to the budget, Good news for employees is no premium increase. One thing I do want to mention on the side of it is we are planning one change for the health plan. It's all on the prescription drug medications. Right now for our tier two and our tier three um, groups, we have a 20% coinsurance with a minimum amount. We're going to switch that to a maximum amount so that employees know when they're going in 
the total amount that they would be paying, possibly potentially paying. So good news for employees there that they'll know going in that it won't be over a certain amount. And then we're gonna make a minor adjustment to our specialty drugs and put the maximum from 150 to 160. Again, we're just trying to keep up with cost of living type of increases to make sure that that's a fair rate given everything happening on the pharmacy side. A couple other things I've attached for you in case it's of interest is the total premium cost by um, county employee share. And then also this slide, which I think is interesting to watch each year. Um, Again, most of you remember those years when we had a pretty big increase on our health costs, and so we saw that going up. But if you look back, overall, we're trending about a 5.1% increase in our premiums each year, which I think is fairly good. And on the dental side, slightly lower than 4%. Any questions? Public comment on this agenda item. Commissioners. Commissioner Bender. So I'd like, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank Carrie for her um, excellent job she does managing these funds. Um, I think you can see by looking at these slides that, um, that she has done that very efficiently. When she thinks there's an increase, she brings it forward to us. And when she um, thinks we can do a premium holiday, or in this case, not increase, um, the premiums at all she brings that forward. I think what the slides don't show is how many sleepless nights she spends in between worrying about some of these things. But I mean, I think it's yeah, a great thing for particularly the employees of Minnehaha County that they get the benefit of that good management that nobody's trying to make um, a profit here. We're just trying to share costs, costs appropriately and make sure everybody has the health and coverage um, that they need when they need it. So thank you. Yeah. Mr. Chair, I would just say this is a, a pleasant surprise for our budget and for our employees. So I think this is good news all the way around. I would just, I know, I think we'll get to talk to Susan later in the agenda, but just uh, I know this has some compounding impacts on our budget. You know, if, if we put in that we expected this to increase by 8% each year in our five year forecast, to now have set that new baseline at 0%. In 2025, that will throw out so, throw off some of those projections. So, but that's to the good, uh, so that's that's good news. But uh, as we uh, progress forward, we and uh, think about uh, property tax opt outs or how we can use other funds. Uh, this is a a major factor in our assumptions for five year forecast and looking out into the future. But this will help all of that math be much easier. So appreciate your presentation today. I agree. You missed your calling as an actuary. I have to say. <laughs> Unfortunately, all this is outside my control, really. I'm glad to bring you good news, though. Okay. Commission action. Make a motion to approve. Second. Se motion to second. Call the roll. Bender? Aye. Kipley? Aye. Benega? Aye. Leinberg? Aye. Kursky? Aye. Motion carries. Consider a motion to approve the extension of the retention bonus program. Uh, the next item I have for you is a request to continue the retention bonus program. You probably recall that this was a newly implemented program in 2022 that was aimed at trying to recruit and retain some of our key law enforcement um, positions. And those positions include the juvenile correctional officers, our correction systems operators in the jail, correctional officers, and deputy sheriffs in the sheriff's office. Um, again, whole purpose is to try and lower turnover and retain those qualified staff. Um, the program offers up to $4,000 to employees at nine months of service up to their third year. So at nine, 18, 27, and 36 months of service. Um, it was originally approved in 2022. It was extended in 2023. And then again in 2024, a lot of discussion about the ARPA funds that had supported that. During the budget hearings this year, we discussed that this is now going to be a general fund expense, and there seemed to be support during budget hearings to continue the program indefinitely. Today is a request that we formally approve it. Just as sort of a recap on the reasons, um, it's important, particularly right now when we're experiencing low unemployment, to make sure that we're competitive. This is a program that's very similar to other entities and what they're offering. Um, but most of this is really wrapped up in turnover. Um, when we implemented the program, we did see a 50% reduction in turnover. 
We know that that was because of other key adjustments made at that time too, but there does seem to be evidence to support that it has had a slight reduction in um, our turnover. And when I say slight, even just saving six people from leaving a year would pay for this program. So it has a cost of $125,000 roughly each year. Um, if we can save six people from leaving, it funds itself. Um, so both uh, JDC Director Jamie Gravett and Chief Deputy Sheriff Jeff Gromer are here today if you have any questions about how it's impacting them in their areas. Um, otherwise, we're asking for your support to continue the program again indefinitely. All right, public comment on this agenda item. All right, turn to the commission for discussion and action. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second that. Motion and a second. Further discussion? All right, call the roll. Blyenberg? Aye. Benega? Aye. Bender? Aye. Kipley? Aye. Karski? Aye. Motion carries. Briefing on proposed updates to the county safety manual. The last item I have for you is just this briefing that we would like to request in a couple of weeks your formal approval on five changes to our safety manual. The first is an update to our disruptive customer behavior section. Um, the reason for the revisions here where it's been a while since we've looked at that language, some things had changed, so we made sure to update it to reflect current practices. And then there was a lot of gram grammatical and restructuring occurring in there too. And I'm looking at Meredith because she was pretty key in going through and recommending those edits. Um, the next four really are proposed new sections to the handbook or to the safety manual, not necessarily new procedures, but something we wanted to make sure was formalized and included in our safety manual because they're relevant. The first is the threat response procedures. I realized it had been many years since we'd sent these out and that they're not currently in the safety manual. So the safety committee and I are recommending that we include those. It just provides some general guidance to employees on how to respond if they should happen to receive a call or a threat from somebody coming into the building or from outside the building. Um, in addition to that, we're um, recommending the inclusion of an appendix with some bomb threat pr procedures um, that would also be available for employees. Again, hopefully not needed, but at least something readily available. The second section for proposed new areas is a TB testing policy. This is a program that we've been offering and started to offer as an annual option to new employees this year but the intent is to make sure that people coming into some of those high risk positions at the jail or JDC are TB tested as they start and then have an option to annually test if they're um, curious or wondering about that. The hepatitis B vaccination program's been going on for many years. This too is aimed at high risk positions only where there's a chance that you might be exposed to blood or bodily fluids. The goal is to make sure we're keeping our employees safe by making sure that their hepatitis B vaccinations are up to date if they want it. Um, many of our employees have already received that, of course, sometime in the past. We also offer, offer a titer in case they want to make sure that the immunity levels are still high. And then the last is temperature rated, related illness prevention. Again, these are things that our facility department and our highway department are aware of and have been paying attention to for years, but we wanted to include a section about some items for employees to be watchful of or careful of. And so we're recommending those for new sections. A lot of thanks goes out to, again, Meredith and Tom in the commission office, Jason Gearman in emergency management, Steve and Mark in facilities and highway. A lot of people have been involved in review. The safety committee has looked at these at least two times. So um, just want to make sure to thank them for their efforts. Any questions? All right, public comment on this agenda item. Commission, this is a briefing. Any questions from the commission? Okay. All right, thank you, Carrie. Thank Appreciate you. the hard work. Briefing on the third quarter 2024 American Rescue Plan expenditure. Susan. Good morning, Susan Beeman with the Auditor's Office. Uh, today we are here to do a briefing on our third quarter of 2024 ARPA expenditures. Um, 
For this last quarter, we spent just over $2.9 million of, of our funding. Uh, that brings our total expenditures to date for this uh, this funding to just over $34.2 million. Just as a reminder, um, we have received just over $37.5 million from this program in, uh, in 21 and 2022. So that leaves just $3.3 million left of that funding. Um, the only new project that was reported on the, that will be reported on this project is the purchase of the tasers for the sheriff's department uh, that you had previously approved using this funding for. Um, and just to remind you, um, we are required to have all of these funds obligated by the end of the year. We actually have two more years to actually spend the money, um, but we anticipate that we'll have everything spent by the end of first quarter of next year, but everything will be obligated by the end of this year with no concerns from our office. I'll just pause there to see if you have any questions. So we don't need quarterly briefings after the first quarter of next year? Uh, so what we'll do is after we've fully spent the money, there will be a closeout process with the federal government and we will also present that to you as well. Thank you. Anything further? No, nothing for me, unless there's any questions from the commission. Public comment on this agenda item. All right. This is a briefing. Any other questions or comments from commission? Commissioner Benega. I, I just want to reiterate the fact that this has been a significant additional responsibility for you and the amount of paperwork and the amount of audits that we've gone through to make this thing work is mind-boggling by most people's uh, attention so thank you for everything you've done on this because uh, this wasn't uh, just a check that we got and we were able to spend it but we had to account for a lot of different things and your ability to manage all that's been awesome so thank you our office is happy to help with that all right thank you susan consider a motion to authorize interfund transfer from arpa fund to general fund highway fund and 24 7 sobriety fund so related to the uh, third quarter opera report, one of the items reported on that is a $459,376 expenditure for salaries and benefits paid for uh, checks uh, dates of July 11th, 2024 through September 19th, 2024. You may recall that as part of the ARPA final rule, um, salary increases to help with worker retention um, is uh, an enumerated expense within that final rule. Um, and so um, back in 2022, the commission authorized uh, a salary increase. Um, so this uh, number of 459,376 is that, that portion of that salary increase uh, for that time period that we are reporting as an expenditure. Uh, so um, that 459,000 is allocated 432,632 to the general fund, uh, 25,721 to the highway fund, and $1,023 to the 24-7 sobriety fund. So we are asking you to authorize that interfund transfer to those funds accordingly. All right, public comment on this agenda item. Commission questions and or action. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. I'll second. Motion and a second. Please call the roll. Blyenberg? Aye. Bender? Aye. Kipley? Aye. Benega? Aye. Kursky? Aye. Motion carries. And a final briefing of expected and potential budget supplements. Final briefing for today, not overall. Thank you, Susan. Uh, last uh, meeting, um, the auditor's office had put on the consent agenda our normal uh, graphs and reports to you for uh, September 2024. Uh, related to that, we just wanted to kind of give you a briefing as we approach year end as to where some areas of our budget are sitting uh, at the end of third quarter, just to make you aware of some areas of potential supplements, as well as a few that are are, are known to us. So uh, we have four funds that we wanted to brief you on today. The first one is the general fund. Um, we currently do not have any department that is actually over budget at this time. Um, there are three areas that we are expecting supplements are on either potentially or 
or we, we highly ex expect that they will be there. Uh, the first item is courts, um, and we've You've um, heard a little bit about this during our budget presentations that things were trending a little bit higher than budget at that point. But currently, our budget for courts is at 77.5% of budget. Um, that's really not too far out of line in total when you think at 75% of the year is expended at the end of September. Um, but what we see is some areas within that budget that are, are pretty high. So both the psych evaluations and the interpreter line items are over budget. Um, our child defense attorney lines are at 95% of budget already at third quarter. Um, and we do see a, a few more of those court appointed attorney bills coming in in that fourth quarter as people finish up the year. Um, so this is an area that is very, very possible that we're going to need a supplement on. We will work with um, Carl and the courts on, on to evaluate what that looks like if there is one needed. But this is an area we're paying attention to. Um, secondly, um, co the county insurance budget, um, currently we are in within about 8,000 of budget on that line item. Um, we've paid our premiums for the year. It's just if we have any unanticipated liability deductibles or anything like that, that would potentially put us over that budget for the year um, and possibly could require a supplement. Um, and then thirdly, the Humane Society, um, we do anticipate a supplement there of around 10,000 when that 2024 budget was put together. We didn't realize that the after hours billing had changed as part of that contract. And so that wasn't factored into that budget number. Um, and so previously to 2024, that after hours is, was part of the total contract and now it's an add on to the contract. So that was a change um, that as when we were in that early part of 23, we didn't realize. So I'll just pause on general fund to see if you have any questions before I move on. Carry on. Okay. Uh, the second item is the E911 fund. Um, we uh, currently are not over budget, but as you may recall, um, the state authorized a uh, a change in that surcharge, um, 911 per line surcharge revenue from $1 to $2 a line, effective July 1. Those dollars pass through to the county or come to the county, then we pass those dollars on to Metro. So it's essentially we're a pass through to Metro for those. But as those dollars are now have doubled for, after, for the second half of the year, we're anticipating that expenditure being higher this year than what we have budgeted because that that surcharge uh, was not increased to the surcharge was not known when we did the budget. Again, there's no net impact to the county um, because we'll get instead of two dollar instead of one dollar a line, we get two dollars a line. We have now more than one dollar a line. We're getting two dollars in revenue. So we anticipate a, a supplement needed for this one as well. We're currently not over budget here either, but again, this is very likely to happen by the end of the year. Okay. Is there more? Uh, and then we have two more. Um, these two are, are known items that we will have supplements for. So the first area is the emergency management fund. Um, so these supplements are needed related to two leases that have been executed within the emergency management fund. One is for the fusion center rental space and the second is for the person family uh, land lease for a communication tower. So um, I'll spare you the boring accounting details of Gatsby 87. Um, but a few years ago, there was a new accounting standard that changed how we have to do, do lease accounting. So when um, we execute leases, we have to record um, a capital outlay for the total of the value of the lease for the duration of the lease, including renewal periods, and then book uh, um, lease proceed revenue. So this supplement is purely related to just that accounting standard um, as part of that new, new, new requirement that we have to follow. And I can go more into detail on Gatsby 87 if anybody wants to hear about it. Okay. Um, and then lastly, the domestic abuse fund. We do uh, see a need for a supplement of just over $4,000 at the end. So just to remind you, we get uh, revenue in from marriage and divorce fees that go in the, into that domestic abuse fund. We budget about $67,000 for allocations to um, in revenue to that fund, and we allocate those that same $67,000 out to the vis uh, Family Visitation Center, the Compass Center, and Children's Home Society. If more revenue comes in, 
we allocate out more in expense. So this is a case where our revenue is higher than the 67,000, so we allocated out that money accordingly. So I'll just pause there to see if you have any questions. I think that's the last of your presentation. Yes, um, and so from here, um, we will be asking for um, the first meeting in December to post notice a public hearing to consider budget supplements at a meeting in December. Um, but we wanted to brief you on where things are sitting on areas of potential supplements and see if you have any questions or concerns as we move forward. Okay. Any public comment on this agenda item? Commissioners, questions? Mr. Chair. Commissioner Kipley. Susan, I'll just kind of go back to an item from really, it's not really a supplement, but uh, back to the health insurance premiums and not doing 8% as projected and budgeted, but doing 0%. Uh, can you put a ballpark figure on the, the value of that uh, to the county of, of what the savings is? And is there any action needed uh, by us to for that overage that's now budgeted? It's kind of what happens to that? Right. So we do, you know, as Carrie um, indicated, we're, we've ex, um, calculated that, that amount of savings now within the budget to be just over half a million, about 550000 is the number she shared. Um, that is part of the adopted budget for 2025. So there's no changes at this point that we would make. Um, if we wanted to make any changes to the budget, we would consider those in 2025. Um, we could evaluate that as part of the um the supplements and carryover supplements that we do in um, usually towards the end of first quarter. Um, usually at that time, we're adding to the budget. We're not subtracting to, so we'd have to evaluate that. Um, but as we go forward, um, we would obviously that does have an impact to our forecast, but that forecast document that we have frequently talked about is it is a, a living, breathing document. It should never be something that's static. Um, it's based upon assumptions we have at that time. Um, and when we built that 8% into the budget, that was back six months ago. Um, and so you don't really have a great history for trends at that point for the year to know where to go forward with. So. Thank you. All right. Thank you for the briefing, Susan. Moving on. Authorize the commission administra administrative officer to sign change order one, reducing construction contingency by $2,302,579 to the Juvenile Justice Center project construction contract. Easy for me to say. All right, good morning, Tom Greco, Commission Administrative Officer. Uh, this is a good news story. Uh, so earlier this year when uh, contracts, subcontracts were bid out for construction of the Juvenile Justice Center project, those bids came in very favorable, and ultimately what that did uh, to our original GMP is change the contingency amount to $4.6 million. Um, as a result of those changes and to basically balance out the books, get the contract amount to where it should be, um, and the contingency at the correct percent, what this particular motion does is changes that contingency from $4.6 million to $2.3 million, so it cuts it in half. Uh, the overall effect of that is changing the GMP for the project from $42.5 million to $40.2 million. Uh, like I said before, this is definitely a good news story. This is our first change order for the Juvenile Justice Center project. Uh, so certainly want to um, thank all the folks that are involved, certainly our partners, uh, our owners, Rep Tegra, Tegra Group, uh, certainly Carl, Henry Carlson Construction and Arc Inc. Um, and this is a step certainly in the right direction. Uh, and just as a side note, the facility is coming along great, and we just encourage folks to go out there and take a look. Uh, subject to your questions, I would uh, urge your approval of this motion, and it would allow me to sign the change order. All right. Public comment on this agenda item. <coughs> Commission action, discussion? I'd have a question. Tom, does this affect any of our approach to the arbitrage or the uh, – or thinking about paying off the bond any sooner or anything related to that? I think as we um, alluded to during the building committee meeting uh, earlier this month, I think that is a question to be answered uh, as time progresses. Some work has been done uh, recently, even based on the discussions at the building committee at, at looking at um, uh, alternatives to include in the project, uh, but no finalized uh, decisions have been made. And of course, the commission would be apprised of that. Yeah, thank you. Commissioner Bender. I would just like to point out too that, you know, part of the, this change order, at least my understanding, is that, you know, originally I think I had mentioned that 
when we were originally doing some of the ground work, um, the, we were running into some un, um, unforeseen circumstances that we thought were going to be um, a real significant expense. And it turned out that those were isolated, and so we were able to get past that without really having to um, expend. I think at one point we were thinking that was going to be in the half million dollar range. So now we're out of the ground for that phase one part, and um, have a lot more confidence that uh, that this is the right move. And we have talked about it at length at the owners' meetings. And so I'm fully supportive of supportive of this, and would make a motion to approve. We'll second that. Additional comment? Please roll call. Bender? Aye. Benega? Aye. Blindberg? Aye. Kipley? Aye. Karski? Aye. Motion carries. Consider a motion to authorize the submission of an application for the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant Program. Good morning, Meredith. Good morning, Commissioners. Meredith Jarko with the Commission Office. Um, so I'm asking today for to approve a motion to authorize the submission of an application. Um, the U.S. Department of Energy's efficiency, Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant Program. Um, it's a grant program that is funded through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, and it's designed to assist states, local governments, and tribal governments in implementing strategies to reduce energy use and improve energy efficiency. Um, so this program allocates out dollars to all of these different governments. So they use a formula to allocate this money. Um, Minnehaha County was allocated $76,450. Um, and these funds can be utilized either as a traditional grant or as an equipment rebate voucher. Um, and so I've been working with Mark Krenz, the director of facilities. Um, if we are awarded these funds, we would utilize them in the form of an equipment rebate voucher to ret retrofit lighting within the county facilities to LED lights. Um, the equipment would be initially purchased with county funds and once installed and the proper documentation is sent to the program, um, an equipment rebate voucher would then be administered to us to replace our funds. Um, the request before the commission would authorize um, the submission for this uh, equipment rebate voucher, and then I would be before you again to accept the funds if we are to be awarded them. Um, and I am happy to answer any questions you may have. All right. Public comment on this agenda item. All right. Questions for Meredith? Mission action. I'll move approval. Second. Motion and a second. Please call the roll. Kipley? Aye. Blindberg? Aye. Bender? Aye. Benega? Aye. Karski? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Meredith. Moving on to public comment. We allow five minutes per individual, 30 minutes total. Good morning. Good morning. <coughs> Excuse me. My name is, oh, good morning, yes. My name is Jean Childs. I live in Lincoln County. A week ago, during public comments, deep and passionate concern was expressed about registering to vote a multitude of voters who do not actually live in a residence in South Dakota. Mr. Karski verified this problem by stating that without this added amount of voter registrations, we would be a low revenue state. My conclusion, only citizens who actually live in an actual residence in South Dakota should be allowed to vote in our state. Thank you. Good morning. As uh, Commissioner Kipley has so eloquently quoted, the Renta Mob is here again. This commission has. Cindy, we do need you to state your name for the record, please. Cindy Meyer, Minnehaha County. Thank you. You have all defamed the character of our auditor, asking her to resign, claiming she's incompetent, she's an embarrassment to the county. Have any of you 
attended the election training that Leah puts on? You know, I, I sit back here and I listen to the comments in regards to when the HR gal gets up here, you praise her and comment on all the hard work she puts in and Susan gets up here and talks about the budget and all the hard work she puts in and you all are just drooling over these people, which they all do a fine job, but the auditor does a fine job as well. But you can't bring yourself to say what a fine job she does. We were at election training last night. We, were, we attended the training in June or in May for the, uh, for the primary election. Again, the training is very professional. She does a very good job. She answers all the questions. People love the fact that they can, ans they can ask her any question. No question is, is out of line. She's very professional, does a very thorough job, and yet none of you folks ever attend that. You've got time to go to the, the county fair and serve meals at the fair. But have any of you sat in on the election training? Have any of you worked at the elections? You know, the elections are a really big deal here in South Dakota. They're as big as the fair. But none of you take the time to show up to any of that information, any of those functions that I am aware of. Leah represents the county. And what you have done to defame her character is election interference. And as I quoted a few weeks ago, it's Executive Order 13848 that President Trump put into motion. It's still an active executive order. It goes right along the lines of treason. And last week we had a very, very uh, lively conversation as it relates to treason. Well, if overthrowing our government is considered cre treason, then surely overthrowing the way in which the government is elected should also be considered treason. I hope you all think about that. Chad Ellsworth, Rapid City. Uh, commenting on the commission's failure to um, act on 1241, the residency statute. Uh, in my opinion, it's a catastrophic burden switch onto the auditor and is election interference, deemed, should be deemed election interference. The commission abdicated abdication of its duties to interfere with a, an election and benefit non-government entities, uh, South Dakota Public Alliance, South Dakota Association of County Commissioners, NACO, ESNS, uh, federal government agencies like the CIA through Perkins Coie, and by the non-public agreements that you have with Lincoln County, Davidson County, and Pennington County. Um, this commenter finds it necessary to seek a public option. Thank you. Gary Meyer had a few comments written down, but before I get to those, I would like to say that less than three months ago, this commission made a rule that the public could no longer remove anything from the consent agenda. You had a person from the public this morning request something from the removal, and once again, you completely ignored him, the public. For the last three years, the group South Dakota Canvassing has bring, been bringing you loads of information on South Dakota elections. During that time, we have not once been put on the agenda to present our information and discuss details. Commissioner Karski, last week you asked what it is that you are supposed to be doing. I would like to offer a couple starters. First, when you asked that question, you looked at all the commissioners. Do you think any of them are up to date on election fraud or what has been uncovered? You had several people in the audience that are knowledgeable on our elections and how they work. You didn't look at any of us. Why did you not ask us? Commissioner Kipley seems to think our sole purpose is to overthrow the stolen 2020 election. He is such a Trump hater he can't get past his own nose to see the big picture. We are fighting to expose election corruption because it affects the outcome of the CO2 debate. Recreational marijuana, open primaries, abortion rights, who gets elected into local offices, etc., etc. I think the rest of you should be able to figure this out, but here we are, two weeks from the election, 
and all these invalid out-of-state voters will be allowed to affect the outcome our, of our election and election issues. And as Cindy stated, if overthrowing our government is considered treason, then surely overthrowing the way in which that government is elected is considered treason. Second, Commissioner Bender had the right idea but didn't follow through. She stated that she had visited with the sheriff. I commend her for that. And they assured her that the evidence had been forwarded to the appropriate people. Why didn't anybody on this board volunteer to follow up on exactly what that meant? Forwarded to the right people. What does that even mean? Who are these people? Is the sheriff keeping track of the progress or did he just pass it along? Is he going to update the commissioners? Plenty of evidence has been presented to the legal system, but for some reason it falls into a black hole. The law is being broken. It seems like somebody should be investigating and arresting those who are guilty. Third thing you could have done is schedule a time to go over our evidence, but you continue to avoid the folks at South Dakota canvassing. Fourth, the deputy state's attorney was sitting right next to you, Dean. Why did you not look at him and ask what you could be doing? He is involved in all aspects of this. He knows all the lawsuits and knows exactly what evidence has been presented to the sheriff's office. But he remained silent while the meeting blows up. Lastly, Commissioner Karski, you got very upset when I questioned your character. But yet you failed to see that the character of the auditor and the election coordinator has been smeared and this board just sips back and hopes it will be swept under the rug. You told me point blank a commissioner is allowed to say whatever they want and you have no control over that. That may be true, but I can tell you, if I was the chairperson and I witnessed this, there would be corrective action. And yes, I'm referring to Commissioner Kipley's false statement, accusation, and slanderous words on September 10th that the auditor is breaking the law, but refuses to say what laws she is breaking. He even refuses to meet with her and tell her. He continues to put false information out there for the fake news, yeah, you, to pick up and then never retracts it, hoping it will destroy her reputation. So because one of you is too arrogant to admit he crossed the line and the rest of you are too complacent to uphold your office, the auditor will not be vindicated of these charges and the commissioner will not be held liable for his slanderous statements and false accusations. Hi, Leah Anderson, Minnehaha County Auditor. Um, I actually just wanted to take a minute to thank my staff, uh, both my full-time staff and the seasonal staff. Yesterday was a very busy day. Um, we had 924 people vote absentee up here. Um, it was a steady flow, but I, like I told our election worker uh, training group last night and many times, we operate, I think, the best absentee in-person voting that a county has. Um, and I say that um, with all sincerity because that line, even when it gets long and it's down to the elevator, it moves very quickly. And so I just want to commend everyone. Also, speaking of the election worker training, um, we have had, we'll have a total of nine classes. We've tonight or today this afternoon will be the fifth one tonight we'll have our sixth one um, I also want to commend our state's attorney's office um, Eric's been participating in those also and helping answer questions um, and I just think that um, all my staff has done a fantastic job we are very sleep deprived at this point um, many of us for three weeks have been here till eight nine o'clock ten o'clock some nights working and working on weekends. And so I just want you to know that um, we are doing everything we can to keep up with the high demand. We probably received about 300 voter registration forms yesterday that we are trying to get processed as quickly as possible. So um, again, I just appreciate everybody's hard work and all the hours that they're putting in. Thank you. Good morning, Scott Anderson, Planning Director for the County. I just wanted to give the public an update on our uh, Envision 2045 meetings. Uh, last week I uh, canvassed or worked in Colton, Baltic, and Renner, uh, handing out brochures or flyers, uh, discussing it with people on the street, um, 
So you may, if you're in those communities, see flyers hanging up. I went to um, uh, gas stations, the city halls, um, restaurants, bars. Um, I'm amazed how many bars have public uh, notice boards. <laughs> But so if you do hear that uh, you've seen Scott Anderson on a Friday in the Colton bar, it is true. I was there <laughs> and I did hang up flyers, but that was all. So um, I'm excited about these meetings and um, they are the first one will be held in Del Rapids on November 7th. And I am on the agenda for the for the 12th, uh, that would be the first meeting in your November meeting uh, to give you an update. I'm hopefully going to have a task force member here to once again go over uh, the density task force and the progress that they made. Um, so, uh, and I'll also report on our first meeting on how that went um, at that on that November 12th. So, thank you. And I probably will be hanging out flyers yet. I would like to get to Humboldt, and then I've been in every single small community in in the in the in the county. Uh, so, thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. Additional public comment. Good morning, uh, Arnie Wolf, Arnold Wolf, um, Minnehaha County. Certainly did not even intend to step up and comment, but just was going to listen. And um, but the comment I was going to make is I know it's several uh, different groups that have to come together to make it happen but right now uh, highway 42 arrowhead is uh, blocked and it all has to come on to 26th street and 26th street is not made for that and the big key comes down to there's only one place to cross the uh, sioux river between madison street and down by lake elvin Highway 42 is the only one in a seven mile stretch. And so what it amounts to is you, all the traffic gets funneled into one spot and then you try and disperse it again. There needs to be a 57th street go through to line up with the Iowa line. And uh, that would help a lot in, especially in situations like this one, when there's a, a block and it could be you know even an accident whatever that could just block it and cause major major problems so <clears throat> that needs to be looked at and getting take care of it's been way too many years of not addressing the issue thank you Arnie all right move on to Commission liaison reports I guess last Wednesday I had a meeting with the Sioux Metro Growth Alliance um, membership advisory board. Maybe I briefed on this. No, I wouldn't have last week. Um, anyway, Sioux Metro Growth Alliance is really reaching out and offering um, become a, a broader um, support base for a lot of the economic development uh, um, offices within the smaller communities. And I think it's a very appropriate um, use of the talent and the resources there. So as, as a county, we are members of that. And I just want to report that I, from my observation, I think that they're doing a good job and doing the right things. Anybody else? Commissioner Blindberg. Um, I just wanted to share that the human services um, case management countywide kickoff event was um, very well put together and a, a huge success. Uh, they had 175 people registered from different entities that work with our um, population that human services uh, serves. And so a big thanks to everybody from human services, Carrie Benz, who was instrumental in planning that and facilitating it, and to all the people who were able to attend there was excellent content provided by a number of speakers, and um, there will be follow-up throughout the year um, to continue providing training to the caseworkers in the area. All right. Moving on to non-action commission discussion. Commissioner Blindberg. I just wanted to mention that I had the opportunity to be in the building yesterday and witnessed exactly what um, the auditor was talking about. And I just wanted to say a big thank you to all of the staff in that office. 
it was all hands on deck and I've never seen the first floor so busy. Um, there were a number of staff from all over involved in helping um, with all of the visitors. I would concur. I turned in my financial report. The auditor's office did a great job. I um, came up here for meetings. Um, the line down the hall was amazing. A lot of people excited to vote. Um, I heard a lot of good positive things from people um, a few hours later that were in line. They called me up. Um, before the meeting, we, I talked to Eric and others about the election school last night. Um, I have great comments about Leah, the professionalism, her entire staff. So I just want to congratulate everybody on that. And, you know, Eric, for your attendance there, too. So um, some good positive things. And thank you to the auditor and, and, and the staff. Two weeks probably, well, it's going to be more than two weeks, but two weeks is D-Day. So I look forward to that whole process. All right, any other non-action commission discussion? All right, we do have an executive session, so I'm going to look for a motion to enter executive session for the purposes of South Dakota codified law, one, 25, two, one, three, four, and six. So moved. Second. Motion and a second, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. And we'll have the executive motion carries. We'll have the executive session here. So begin in about 10 minutes. <laughs> 